I'm not dead. That sounds like something interesting. This is Alaska's version of Grand Central Station. There's a, a huge percentage of the state, like 98% or something, that's not even accessible by road. So airplanes, whether wheels or floats, have to be able to service people that live or have want to run businesses in the wilderness. Everything is flown into and out of the Redoubt Mountain Lodge on a float plane. Everything. You fly for about 45 minutes down the inlet, down the ocean. And it's, it's new and unique, but it's not quite spectacular beauty. It's just ocean and, and seashore and uh, coastline. And then you get into the mountains all of a sudden. A trip to Redoubt Mountain is like a trip back in time to another world. Into, I can't even tell you how many dozens of lodges over the, my flying career and um, Redoubt Mountain Lodge is the most beautiful location for one thing. There are no roads, no cell phones, and no reminders of life as we know it. This is wilderness. This is what earned Alaska the honor of being considered the last frontier. The main features is certainly the Mount Redoubt is to be able to look at a 10,000 foot volcano, active volcano within view from a number of different angles around the surrounding area. But what's also become really popular is just the Crescent River Valley. Just a picturesque valley with uh, rivers converging and flowing right through the center of it and uh, 4,000 foot peaks either side of you. Peaks that seem to watch over you. Every turn, every view filled with towering mountains. I think it's just more and more difficult to find completely remote locations anymore with, with no other operators and, and no, other, no other crowds. At Redoubt Mountain Lodge, isolation is their specialty. The lodge is situated on five privately owned acres nestled in the shadow of Redoubt Mountain. All this in the middle of four million acres of national park and preserve. Here, you are alone. Just you the other guests, the staff, and the wilderness. We have six little private log cabins um, throughout the property. They each have their own bathroom, which includes a toilet, shower, sink, hot water, heat, uh, with a thermostat inside for you to control. Uh, we have a queen and a twin bed in each cabin with just the most, the best flannel sheets ever. At Redoubt Mountain Lodge, remote doesn't mean roughing it. Everyone says that the beds hold them hostage every morning and they don't want to get out. There's a cedar hot tub enclosed in a gazebo with screen windows that open. It has 300 degree views of Crescent Lake and the Chigmet Mountains with our hanging glacier. The main lodge is where all the activity happens. It's kind of the heart of the property. Um, it's where all the life is, where I feed you, where you come to converse with the other guests, where everybody comes to just kind of chill and hang out. And we want to make sure that people are coming here and getting what they want. You're really feeling like the vacation they're on is theirs. Life at Redoubt Mountain Lodge is simple for the guests. A simple place in the middle of the most wild, untamed land you will ever visit. In Alaska, everything is bigger, wilder, and more extreme. We call it kind of rustic luxury because for everything that's here, it was brought in by a float plane, which is pretty incredible to think about. I mean, nothing's really fancy five-star rooms, but they're really nice and they're really comfortable. And the beds are, you know, the beds are cozy and the, the showers are hot. 
and the towels are fluffy, the food is good, and the beer is cold, and I think people get here and they realize what they really need to live and be happy. And I think it brings people down, back down to the basics of what do I need to be happy? Sometimes um, people are on hospice, okay? They're on hospice and maybe they've got anywhere from a month to three days left. And they have needs for personal care. You know, wouldn't it be nice if you could just work through the stuff and grieve and be a daughter and talk about things rather than worrying about, oh my God, personal care. Uh, we go in and we make it so that the family has time to be a family. It's too heavy, it becomes too heavy and the person can't um, do the emotional work. The definition of New Horizons is that you get paid here every day. Welcome to the Waterford Grand. I am Chef Wagner and today we're going to make beef yakisoba noodles. So to make this dish, we have Japanese yakisoba noodles. We have red and green bell peppers with a yellow onion, uh, nicely julienned with some nice julienned carrot. We have some local hanger steak that we'll be using for our beef. And then of course some fresh green onions. And to finish it all, to bring it all together, we have a great sesame ginger dressing. We'll get hit the pan with a little sesame oil. You don't want too much, you don't want to be overpowering with the sesame oil, you want to have a good balance of flavors. Just let it cook. Next we'll add a good handful of the yakisoba noodles. We want this to cook together. So when the meat's almost done, because we want everything to finish at the same time, we'll add a nice handful of these lovely vegetables. Okay, we're just going to turn the heat down a little bit. This is when you can start hitting it with your dressing. And that's what's cooking at the water for Grand. So next we're going to make a really simple Asian cucumber salad. Uh, let's make the dressing first. So we're going to do a little rice wine vinegar. About two tablespoons should be suffice, two to three. And about half a tablespoon of sesame oil. Uh, next we're going to add a little bit of crushed chilies, just a pinch. And then we're going to add about three pinches of sugar, and that's really going to go well against the uh, rice wine vinegar. You just take a beater, just get everything mixed up nice. Next, we'll add the cucumber. Really love this stuff. I'm just going to add it all. Gari, this is pickled ginger. Uh, it comes in pink form or it comes in white just on the edge of the, gar of the ginger. A good pinch of cilantro, just if you use a smaller hands, two pinches, okay? And then a little toasted sesame seed, again about a good pinch. You want to fold everything nice and gentle together. You don't want to bruise up the cucumber, it will start looking bruised up. And the next you're going to spoon carefully right in the middle. And then just drizzle some of that great dressing right over the top. And here you have it. That's what's cooking out the water for Grant. I cannot begin to tell you why Alaska gets into your soul. I really don't understand how it happens, but trust me, it just happens. 
Perhaps it's the remoteness of it all. Redoubt Mountain Guides will take you on a truly remarkable hike to places few have ever set foot on before. There are easy hikes, always ending up with a payoff. And there are our more rugged hikes for the truly adventurous types. Meadows, water, and those mountains. Places you will never find another person. Unbelievable. Oh. Oh my word. Look at that. Oh my gosh. Readout Mountain Guides know the country and will introduce you to Wild Alaska. responsible but are we you know it's funny though because that's the same things that were being said about our parents when they were our age I just don't buy it all you hear in the media is that the world's going to hell I want to feel like my voice matters I want to feel like I have a place in this world I want to hear about the good things that are happening in the world so let's talk about all this real stuff let's have these conversations I mean why not About a year ago, a lot of people in our community lost their hearing services. A big agency closed. You don't want to start over and you don't know where to turn. Grant's Hearing Centers will help you. I love being able to help people hear better. Yeah, that's the big thing. With your permission, Grant can access your files. Grant's Hearing Centers in Eugene and Cottage Grove. We put the hearing aids on, turn them on, and then they can actually, uh, it's just li like the light switch comes on. They can hear so well. Listening to you is our business. Call Grant's Hearing Center. I'm a pioneer to my own life. The apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. 65-year-old Ken Darling looks a little out of place walking the streets of Eugene, Oregon. And I've got a lot of help uh, by having, a, having the heritage I do. Actually, much of this town once belonged to his family. Uh, my mother was a Skinner, her father was a Skinner, his father was a Skinner, and then Eugene Franklin Skinner. Ken is the great-great-grandson of Eugene Franklin Skinner, founder of Eugene, Oregon. Little tiny kid, you know, I mean, hearing from Grandpa all the stories, you know, that he had. Ken grew up in Portland, but remembers visiting the Skinner family in Eugene as a little boy. It's, it, it's with me all the time, you know. And if you're standing in front of the library, probably every other day, you'll see me pass by the Jim Carpenter sculpture of my great-great-grandfather and positioning myself exactly the way my great-great-grandfather was. Is some resemblance you know, for whatever it's worth. Eugene Skinner settled along the river near the Butte that bears his name in 1847. How amazing I'm sure uh, people thought it was that oh the government's going to give me 640 acres, I have to stay on the land for four years, I have to be married, and I have to have a house. I walked this land. This is what 640 acres looks like from south of 8th all the way to the river, including the Butte. Grandpa, wh where's my piece of property? <laughs> Later, Eugene Skinner donated 40 acres to help create the county seat that became the town of Eugene City. 
Ken recently found his way back to Eugene looking for the same thing his great-great-grandfather was looking for, a new start. Um, I got caught up in the crash, uh, financial crash, so basically my career was gone. Ken, like his great-great-grandfather Eugene, is not sure what the future might hold, but he thinks this may be the best place to start looking. You know, I know struggle as well, uh, and so it is exciting to study my family and see what kind of struggles they went through. Just shores me up to, um, uh, to do what's necessary. It makes you wonder, what would Eugene Skinner think of his little town today? I have a feeling he would probably be pretty scared. Only a few remnants of the time when Eugene Skinner was alive remain. There's his watch. The first clerk's office, tiny building, and he was the clerk for the county. I've been up to the gravesite at the Masonic Cemetery. History has a way of linking the present with the past, and maybe that's what Ken Darling is looking for, a connection. To be shown something so touchable as far as a pioneer and what they had to go through, that it will say something to them and their lives. And, you know, well, if Eugene Franklin Skinner can do it, so can I. My name's Ken Darling, and Eugene Franklin Skinner was my great great grandfather. I feel like I'm home. My name is Max Foster. I'm 23 years old. I'm a certified Mazda tech here at Kiefer Mazda. My dad was, you know, like a blue collar guy, you know, worked his whole life. I always kind of wanted to follow in his footsteps. Uh, and so being here, getting to be able to use my hands and, you know, tools and all that stuff, it's, yeah, it's, it's totally manly and it's fun. I like it a lot. Um, you know, this is someone's car and I try to think, what if I was coming in, or what would I expect? And keeping that in mind, it's easy to make sure everything's how I would want it in my own car. You know, everybody, everybody wants everybody to, to succeed, so it's, it's a great team environment. What I will tell you, you know, about our food is that we prepare everything from scratch. So we make sure we hire people that have the passion for making food. That's one of the ingredients. The other one, we make sure that our recipes, they use the ingredients that we tell them to use. And we, before we uh, put it into the market, we make sure we test, you know, try it. What I love about this business is the people. I'm a people person, so I love to interact with people. And I love to make people feel good. It's not going to kill you. Okay guys, so time's wasting. Don't wait any longer. We need to get moving. Um, I'm gonna go take a shower, so you people gotta go. Sorry. Excuse me, but what were you doing in my bathroom while I was shaving? <laughs> you guys are following me everywhere. Listen, you can do lunch with Rick Dancer, but you cannot follow me to the bathroom. Anyway, what I wanted to tell you is Abe gives away two free dinners every month. Uh, to a lucky winner. You just have to go in, have dinner, fill out your form, and put it in the box, and we draw a name. This month, it's Jan Bliss, B-L-I-S-S. -S. You are the Ranchito Grill winner. Now, get out of here. Um, it's a 1974 Piper uh, Super Cub. They're, they're vital. If you don't have roads anywhere, you can only get there by air. Oh my goodness, there's nowhere you can't take it. The only way to truly discover wild Alaska is in an airplane. Well, each flight's always better than the next. I mean, uh, it, well, you'll see here real shortly, but uh, it's just spectacular, it's untouched, it's rugged. 
unbelievably rugged and, uh, and beautiful all the same. Ryan Richards calls flying his therapy. How often do you get to take this out? Um, I, if I don't fly about every three days, I start getting pretty miserable to be around. So what, what does it do for you? Oh, I mean, it's like my relief. I mean, what's working out? I mean, what's your, what, what's like your, what's your deepest passion? Uh, take that away. I mean, that's what you got with aviation with me. As you glide over mountaintops and through canyons over rivers, you can't help but wonder how many other humans have actually laid eyes on this land. I can fly five minutes from this location here and find places likely nobody has ever seen and certainly never set foot on. Alaska is like that. You really do get lost in the vastness of what's out there. Every corner a reminder of your smallness to landscape so big, so overpowering, it's almost mind-numbing. In a small plane, you get more than a view. You get a feel for the land and its inhabitants. Flying just feet over the rivers and over the mountains leaves no trace of your entrance into a place that almost feels holy. As we climb over a mountain, Ryan, who plays in these hidden ravines and valleys all the time, spots something he's never seen before, something out of the ordinary. 3,000 feet above the ground, hidden on a mountaintop, we find an unnamed lake. Ryan is one of those people who is not afraid to risk. He thrives on adventure, and while I do too, to some degree, landing in an unknown lake, not knowing whether it's big enough to get out, creates perspiration along my back. But my mind and my heart are soaring with excitement. We hike around the lake, look over cliffs into new valleys, and talk out loud about the best day we ever had that day. Knowing it will not last forever. As long as I live, I will remember that day. That day at the lake and the feeling of being in a place where only God sets foot. So this is what makes Alaska so cool, is you can go, this is, you can go places like this, land your plane, if you're with Ryan, come in, name your own lake, which we are deeming this Richards Lake, because Ryan Richards and Richard Dancer, and, uh, and go away and have a story to tell. Plus, what makes it really fun is that if something happened and we couldn't get out of here, we'd be in trouble <laughs> but that's what makes adventure and that's why you do things that are a little risky and that's why you do things that are a little out of the box because I think we're all tired of sitting behind a computer and a typewriter and sick of Facebook sick of all that crap and this is not Facebook this is not social media <laughs> this is the real world I hear a lot of people talk about going back to the real world I kind of would question whether going back is really the real world. I think I found it in Alaska.
So I can't remember how long ago it was, but the second time the controversy of Whole Foods came up, I have the soapbox, and um, I brought it down here in the parking lot because I was kind of irritated uh, that people were so upset that you know Whole Foods, or some people were upset that Whole Foods was coming. So I'm going to show you that soapbox from then, and then we'll think about what's happening right now. You know, I try to stay away from the only in Eugene line, but really, this is one of those, you have to say only in Eugene. A Whole Foods grocery store wants to build a 50,000 square foot grocery store in the heart on this block in downtown Eugene. We've been talking for years about restoring downtown, bringing business down here, bringing people down here. That's what a grocery store would do. And then what I see is all this complaining about, I don't want a Whole Foods, we want something else. Well, Something else doesn't want to come here. Whole Foods wants to come here. And then I hear people saying, well, it's going to destroy the mom and pop grocery stores. I don't believe that. This is Eugene. I think people are loyal to those stores and will continue to shop there. But this gives people an alternative. And for people like me, I will come here sometimes. I work down here. It's another business. It's another reason to bring people downtown. And for goodness sakes, it's a grocery store. It's not like they're selling nuclear arms.